Hey guys, it's Robin and welcome to my channel. Today we are going to be talking about a very, very huge case in mainstream media. Um, we're going to be talking about John Benet Ramsey. Her case has gone unsolved for over two decades now. Before her death, John Benet Ramsey was a six year old beauty queen. Um, she was in child beauty pageants. This was like a huge part of her case at the time. I can even remember this and I was so very young uh, when this case was like blowing up in the news but I can still remember them talking about beauty pageants and things like that and kind of relating it to her mom's behavior or whatever. But she was a six year old growing up in Boulder, Colorado with her family in a pretty, you know, affluent home. John Bonet died on December 25th, 1996. Now, her mom says that she remembers putting her to bed that same night. I mean, it was Christmas night, so I suppose, you know, they had a day. I think they it, they were having like a, maybe a get together or something or just like doing like a family, you know, party because it's Christmas. Um, but then the very next day, very early in the morning, around 5.52 a.m., she called the police and reported that her daughter was missing and there was a ransom note left behind. The ransom note demanded $118,000 in cash, which is very strange. There was actually a lot of strange things about the ransom note, but the exact price point was very similar to what the father had made as a bonus um, with his job. And so it was very, that was strange, of course. But also the ransom note itself, I will link everything for this case down below because there's so many interesting things you can read up on this case because of the buildup over the decades. But the ransom note was very, very long and it was just like, it was two and a half pages. So to the point where it was more like, you know, becoming like an essay than just like a regular ransom note. Like regular ransom notes are pretty like quick and straight to the point. But this one was very long. It had lots of weird exclamations and acronyms that were being used. And it was just a very odd note. Also, there were no fingerprints on this ransom note. And I just want you to remember all of this for later because the ransom note pops up again and it's pretty important, I think. So after the mother says that, you know, her daughter is missing, you know, blah, 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 calls the police, um, the police show up and they pretty much fail. I think the police honestly dropped the ball in this investigation because literally they didn't even secure the scene well enough. To, just let me, I'll just, uh, let me just tell you guys what happens. The police, they come to the house and of course they are, you know, looking through the house, you know, just to see maybe like if she wandered somewhere in the house and the parents just couldn't find her or something. A police officer actually says he goes into the basement and he walks up to a door with a wooden latch on it and he stands in front of it and he contemplates it for a second, but then turns around, you know, and goes back up. So <laughs> it's just, I don't know big red flashing signs are like you know flashing at you but you like kind of turn around but whatever i just think when you're uh in a position where you're looking for a child you should look in all places especially small hiding spots possibly but that's just me after all this happens uh one of the officers tells the father and one of his friends to you know look through the house again you know for any clues anything you know out of place whatever whatever so the father actually you know he does the little search he makes his way down to the basement to this wooden latched door he opens it and that is where her body is found when she is found she has duct tape over her mouth she has a nylon cord around her wrists and her neck and she also has a white blanket kind of covering her like upper body. But yeah, he ends up taking her body and carrying it upstairs, which completely ruins all of the, you know, possible forensic evidence that could have been found on the scene. Which is so frustrating because, you know, if the police had kind of like done their work and been a little bit more, you know, in it, then they possibly could have found the body, had not disturbed it, and so then there could be a lot more evidence for them to go off of. After the body is found, clearly this is no longer a kidnapping situation, a ransom situation, or anything like that. 
this is a murder investigation. So on December 30th, the police start taking the DNA of, you know, the father, John, and all of the family members, you know, people related, people close. Now, remember that ransom note we were talking about earlier? So on January 3rd of 1997, which is like, you know, a few days later, really, um, the police find that the actual paper that the ransom note was written on was from inside the house. Whoever wrote this note had to write it while they were inside the house. So either they had come in, like an intruder had come into the house and, you know, just decided to write this note, which would be very strange in my opinion if a family is sleeping upstairs and you're in their house unwelcome and you're just writing a long, long, like two and a half page ransom note, then I just think that's very strange. The only other thing besides an intruder coming in and writing the note themselves is that someone in the house already wrote the note. Now, a few months later, the police actually do handwriting analysis on the letter, and on March 7th, they just basically say it couldn't have been John who wrote the note, so John's the father. He's not, I guess he, at least he didn't write the note. But they can't take out the fact that the mother might have written the note because, you know, handwriting analysis, from what I've learned about it, like in my past at university, is that they there are certain ways people write and like the, the strokes that make it very, um, like it just differ differentiates like handwriting. So the fact that they couldn't say like, no, it wasn't her is very strange to say in the least because handwriting is very particular there's certain ways people write certain ways their strokes are so I thought that was interesting but yeah the mother her name is Patsy Ramsey and she cannot be confirmed as n not being the one who wrote it so that's another little little weird tidbit now finally on April 30th both John and Patsy are interviewed by the police I don't know why it took them so long to be interviewed but my best guess is that because of, you know, probably like their lawyers telling them not to speak to the police unless it's like an investigation, blah, 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 you know, or just things just in general getting held up. But that's a pretty long, a long time span in between, but I don't know. I think that's when the police probably like really start to look into the parents, honestly, and they were like, okay, we actually need to investigate them because a lot of strange things have been happening around them. So on August 6th of 1997, a detective actually resigns and says that the police office basically has compromised the investigation and that they've crippled the case. Basically just kind of calling out the police office, you know, whatever, the police station, whoever's working on the case and saying that they probably, you know, screwed up the case themselves and so... I don't know. I think that's very strange. I do think that in this case, I'm not going to go so deep into it or else this video would be like literally like an hour long, but it just seems like there are lots of things that the police missed out on and that they made a mistake. And I don't know if they're like, you know, making all these mistakes on accident, but yeah, there's a lot of things and I can't include everything. I just want to get like the main important details in. And so, but there are lots of things that the police have that I just think they like totally screwed up on. So I think that's maybe what he's referring to, or maybe he has more in-depth knowledge, you know, like of actual maybe bad things that the police were doing or trying to cover up or not, you know, adding to the case. Who knows? So from around 1997 to 1999, there actually is a whole court case, like a trial and everything, with the grand jury. The grand jury actually gets to hear the forensic evidence, but, you know, because it's not indicted, they basically get rid of it, everything's kind of thrown out, and they're sworn to silence. They can't, you know, say what the actual forensic evidence was. It was later revealed that the grand jury wanted to indict John and Patsy Ramsey. However, the DA was against it. And, you know, when this case came out, lots of people were like, very like, oh, you know, like it could have been an intruder, it could have been the parents, it could have been a family friend. And so I kind of get that why the DA didn't want to go after it unless they thought that they had like a solid 
case against them. I just don't think maybe there wasn't enough evidence because lots of the evidence that could have been found was messed up by the police not doing uh, that thorough of a search, I think. From my opinion, I just don't think they did not thorough enough of a search. And the DNA that they did find, it wasn't um, matching up to really anyone. And so, uh, in July of 2008, uh, there are DNA tests done and you know because of the time distance of course like you know they've gotten better with this whole DNA thing and so the DNA there suggests that people in the Ramsey family could no longer be considered suspects in the case that same year a former school teacher John Mark Carr I believe his name is he confesses to killing her but it turns out it's not it's not true, holds no substance basically, like the police find out he's pretty much lied about it. And this actually like happens quite a bit in this case because of, I guess because of how big it is, it happens quite a lot. The case was actually reopened in February of 2008 and there has been really recent updates on this case. Not really like on the case but in the news and mainstream media. So like literally a few days ago a incarcerated sex offender admitted to killing John Bonet and he said this in a note to one of his former classmates. His name is Gary Oliva and he is a 54 year old man. He's in jail. He's been writing these letters back and forth to his former classmate Michael and basically he said that he killed her on accident and blah blah blah. I'll include the letter also for that in the links down below. Despite that, the police are, you know, clearly they've heard about this, but they are pretty much calling it BS, saying that they've already investigated him because, you know, they investigated so many people. Um, but yeah, they investigated him and that he's not really, like, a suspect, I guess. Or maybe I shouldn't say he's not a suspect, but what he's saying isn't true, pretty much. Like, he's kind of making up kind of like the other teacher did. And so... I just want to get into the fact that I just feel like there in this case there have been so many people who have come forward pretending to have killed her this is such a publicized case um, I feel like lots of blunders were made I honestly think there are two different you know things that could have happened in this case it was either someone a very close family friend or a family member you know, that didn't live in the house, like not an immediate family member, but someone who like lived outside the house, they were able to come in and, you know, kill this girl. Or it was an immediate family member. Uh, the brother is very, um, it's people, lots of people accuse, accuse him of having killed her. And so that's also another thing, but I think it's someone who knows the family. For the ransom amount to be so close to what the father makes, I just think that's really strange. And also, just the way things were done. I mean, granted, the family, uh, they lived in a neighborhood with like, I think like 30 plus sexual offenders in their neighborhood, or like within two mile radius of their neighborhood. And then there was also like a hundred um, burglaries that happened, you know, within the months before she was murdered. But I just think that I honestly think someone in her family or someone close to the family got to her, murdered her, and did this, and I don't think we can kind of cancel out her family member, no matter what DNA says, because I honestly think they blundered that, like, it became really clear that they did, but, you know, that's just my opinion. Tell me what you guys think down below. I honestly think it's one of her family members and I just think it's really sad that this happened. That's all I have to say for this case. There's so much on this case that I could comment on but I won't be able to fit it all in this video. So thank you so much for watching. As always, I love you guys and I'll be out back with another video. So see you guys next time. Bye!